Good morning, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about the work we've been doing in Falls Lake to define the balance between nitrification and denitrification. Um, should mention that this work has been, uh, we're, we're collaborating with Mike Peeler's lab in this. Um, he's been measuring directly, measuring denitrification, and a lot of what we focused on is uh, directly measuring nitrogen fixation and then estimating denitrification using the nitrogen budget. Um, so the reasons why understanding this balance is important is because the microbial nitrogen processing that happens in reservoirs often ends up determining the limiting nutrient in a, in a reservoir, determine whether it's either nitrogen limited or phosphorus limited. Um, also, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria are, as seen here in this picture, they're, um, a lot of them can form surface blooms and a lot of them produce toxins. So understanding where they're getting their nitrogen from is key for managing the water quality when those blooms are a problem. And also, if you can measure one of either nitrogen fixation or denitrification, it can uh, help you in constructing the total budget. So if you measure one, it helps you constrain other parts of the budget that may be hard to measure. And that's actually part of how we use nitrogen fixation here through the end budget to back calculate denitrification rates. So the reason I got interested in this is because I noticed that cyanobacteria that are potentially capable of fixing nitrogen. These are these contain heterocysts, they're in the family Nosticales. Um, during the summer, they're a large fraction of the phytoplankton biomass. So this is a graph showing, I think, five years worth of data or eight years worth of data um, from a station in the middle of Falls Lake. As you can see, during the summer, the fraction of total biomass that's potentially nitrogen fixing can reach almost 80% at times. So can represent a significant fraction of the biomass. Um, and yet, currently in the water quality models that are being used to make decisions about nutrient loading, um, nitrogen fixation is a pro isn't a process that's within those models. That's per, um, yeah. So questions for this project were, um, does, do, does microbial processing of nitrogen in Falls Lake lead to a net production of new nitrogen in the system through the process of nitrogen fixation? Or is denitrification more important so the microbial nitrogen processing actually removes nitrogen from Falls Lake? Um, also, is nitrogen fixation quantitatively important compared, a quantitatively important input of nitrogen compared to the external loads coming from streams and from atmospheric deposition? So, is it worth including in models or is nitrogen fixation trivial and we don't have to worry about it? And then additionally, what factors, things like light, nutrient ratios, this kind of thing, what factors are driving nitrogen fixation? We find out in fact that it is important and worth including in models. It's nice to have information about what's driving or what's stimulating nitrogen fixation so we can better model it. So the, so the physical work we did involved uh, directly measuring nitrogen fixation at six different sites in Falls Lake. So the map here to the left shows that the six sites pretty much span the full length of Falls Lake, with the exception of the area above Highway 85, which is too stumpy to get a boat in. Um, so what we did, we collect photo zone composite samples at all six sites on six different dates from May through October in, uh, last, in 2020. Um, and then we used acetylene reduction assays to measure nitrogen fixation in clear bottles and in dark bottles. And that allowed us to assess nitrogen fixation caused by photosynthetic cyanobacteria versus heterotrophic bacteria. Um, we did that at uh, six different depth levels in the water column to see how the cyanobacterial nitrogen fixation would be affected by the light gradient. Um, and then along with these measurements of nitrogen fixation, we also measured phytoplankton biomass and community composition, nutrients and nutrient ratios. And we measured hydrographic profiles at each station where we collected water and as well as a light gradient. And that allowed us to compare the conditions where we collected the water from to the conditions that we were incubating them at, which are shown here on the little yellow star. It was Upper Barton's Creek. Um, those ancillary measurements are also really important for understanding 
what kind of factors uh, stimulate the nitrogen fixation. And here are some results. So these are box plots of nitrogen fixation at the six different stations, and they're oriented from upstream to downstream, left to right. Um, all these rates are really low. I'll show you in just a little bit in comparison to stream loads, but all these rates were very low, and there really was no strong downstream pattern of nitrogen fixation. And as expected, there was a, a light response. So this is showing um, different incubation depths. This ranged from about 50% of incident light at the shallowest incubation depth down to about 1% of radiance at the bottom. And there was a weak but statistically significant uh, light gradient, which um, we expected to see because nitrogen fixation is a process that relies on products of photosynthesis. So, so we used our direct nitrogen fixation measurements to put together um, the pieces of nitrogen budget for Falls Lake. So those included inputs of nitrogen fixation, atmospheric deposition, and stream nitrogen loads. Um, and here I'm showing the nitrogen budget, but I'm also showing as a per, some of these uh, terms as percents of stream loading. So here you can see nitrogen fixation was about 2% of stream loading. So, you know, pretty small. Um, so then if we look at what comes into the lake versus what goes out, both of nitrogen and phosphorus, and if we assume that the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus leaving or the, the ratio of the amount uh, that's retained in the lake of nitrogen and phosphorus, um, if we compare that to what shows up in the sediments, the nitrogen to phosphorus sediment ratio, the difference between the two, the, the, the difference between those two can be attributed to the amount of nitrogen that was removed from the sediments by the process of denitrification. So with this nitrogen budget, we can calculate denitrification rates. And as a percent of stream flow, it looks like it's about 14% of stream flow over the period of 2006, 2018. So fairly significant and a lot higher than our estimates of nitrogen fixation. So it appears that the balance of nitrogen processing, microbial nitrogen processing, tilts in favor of denitrification in Falls Lake. So here we're, I'm showing all the numbers um, it, as expressed as percent of total stream loads. So nitrogen fixation, again, only about 2% of stream loads. Denitrification, 14%. But this plus or minus 16% standard deviation, that was the interannual variability in that time period, 2006 to 2018. Um, and then these direct measurements of denitrification that I'm showing, these were made by Mike Peeler's lab. And these came from core incubations over three different time periods during the summer of 2020. So this plus or minus 33% is the amount of variation between those three sampling events. So again, there's a lot of uncertainty in the uh, measurements, but it looks like denitrification overall is a lot more important than nitrogen fixation. So it does appear that denitrification removes significantly more nitrogen than nitrogen fixation, and that can lead to a nitrogen limited system. So one of the policy implications of this is that uh, it supports nitrogen load management for the fall, for Falls Lake. Also, the current water quality models that are neglecting nitrogen fixation as an important process might be justified in neglecting nitrogen fixation. Um, for continuing work, we're going to um, look at the lake more uh, as a spatially heterogeneous water body. I think it's it's recognized now that you know from the head of the lake to the end of the lake is very different, but there are also differences in water quality and chemical conditions in the tributary arms. So we're going to look at the balance of nitrogen fixation and denitrification in these tributaries that may be under greater influence by differences in sources or land use that could change the nitrogen phosphorus ratio of the inputs. Um, we're also going to use nutrient addition experiments to see the degree to which nitrogen fixation could be stimulated by phosphorus inputs. And then after all that, we'll reassess the uh, comparison of nitrogen fixation and denitrification and see if this story still holds up and nitrogen fixation really is not a very important process. 
So for a one second, uh, one sentence summary, uh, in Falls Lake, it looks like denitrification is a lot more important than nitrogen fixation as a microbial nitrogen process.